And uh, let's start with the case presentation first. The 36-year-old male presented to the ED with atypical chest pain. Father died suddenly two months before. Murmuring exam told he had a murmur at age of 19. No diagnosis or follow-up. Active lifestyle, played football and basketball, manual labor without limitation. So physical exam, blood pressure 140 over 55, bonding pulses, and the arterial pulses of bispherians. Apical impulse displays and sustained palpable S4. So S1 normal, S2 normally split, A2 increased, systolic click, faint ejection, systolic murmur, and the grade three long diastolic murmur. These are the echocardiogram. <coughs> These are the parasternal long axis <coughs> with Doppler. And then So what is the cause for the aortic regurgitation? One, annular dilatation. Two, cusp perforation. Three, bicuspid valve with cusp prolapse. Four, dilatation of the STJ. And five, bicuspid valve with cusp prolapse and annular dilatation. So 48, it's divided between three and five, which is good. Let's get some more images. <clears throat> it's a parasternal long axis. You can see the end diastolic diameter 73. You can see the EF is relatively preserved. Please keep it high on the blood pressure, 140 over 55. So the next question I would like to ask you, what do you think, how severe is the aortic regurgitation? Mild, moderate, moderate to severe, severe, or not sure? So it's between severe and not sure. All right. So let's look at the images again. Uh, Dr. Connolly, can you comment on this? So the anterior mitral leaflet, the arrow points out there, the red arrow points out there that the anterior mitral leaflet is fluttering during diastole and uh, suggests a significant mm -hmm. um, uh, jet of aortic valve regurgitation. So I think Sari commented on that earlier in her presentation. Yeah. The so-called Austin Flint murmur would be expected because there's reduced uh, uh, mitral excursion. Obviously, the rather of pointing out the blood pressure, the low diastolic blood pressure. The end diastolic diameter is really big, 73 millimeter, and the EF is relatively preserved around 50%. So the echo report, it's a bicuspid aortic valve with fusion of the right and the left cusp, severe aortic valve regurgitation, sinus of false valve dilatation, 42 millimeter, normal ascending aorta, and no sign of coarctation, severe left ventricular enlargement, and diastolic is 73 with the diastolic, a systolic diameter is 49, severe eccentric left ventricular hypertrophy, and the EF is 55%. So what should be the next step? Operation, CT or MRI, cardiac catheterization, medical therapy, or uh, exercise test. So uh, the majority said straight to operation. I think earlier this morning, uh, you had a presentation about bicuspid aortic valve. There is a high association with aortic disease, so probably we should not proceed immediately to the operating room until we have some kind of imaging of the ascending aorta in the aortic arch and the aortic root. So the next step would be a CT images. And the CT images, just a representative slides, you can see that uh, the aortic root is mildly enlarged. The largest diameter on the CAT scan is 41 millimeter. The ascending aorta and the aortic arch was normal. There was the largest diameter was around 36 millimeter, and there was no sign of coarctation. So the learning objectives. So this patient is an uh, uh, asymptomatic severe aortic regurgitation in the setting of the bicuspid valve. So we're going to identify the features of the severe aortic regurgitation, describe indication for intervention in patient with asymptomatic severe aortic regurgitation, and develop some management strategy for patients with bicuspid aortic valve related aortic regurgitation. 
So bicuspid aortic valve, I'm not going to go into too much detail. You heard earlier this morning. It's very important probably one of the most common cardiac anomaly affecting one or two percent of the patient population. It's a polygenic disease. It's a failure of separation of the uh, primordial semilunar valve during embryogenesis. The, during the embryogenesis, there is no one anomaly. It's more like in, in a spectrum of different phenotypes. This picture represents one of the most common type of bicuspid aortic valve. It's called the Sievers one with a uh, fusion between the left and the right cusp and with a RAFI, which I learned this morning. I always pronounced it uh, incorrectly. Uh, so you know that if we can know incidence one or two percent, there is a male dominance, and uh, most of the valve is going to present, and a third of the fifth decades of life, you're going to develop some kind of surgical grade, surgical grade aortic valve disease or some kind of aortopathy. The regurgitation is the minority, usually in 10 percent. What you really have to do about the bicuspid aortic valve, the most well-known classification is the Sievers classification, Come, sometimes can be overwhelming. But in this diagram I wanted to present you, the most important you know that there is two functional cusps, two commissures, and there is a rudimentary commissures which usually never reach the same height as the normal commissures. So let's look at the valvular heart guidelines. Uh, should we operate on this patient or not? Uh, if you look at the patient is asymptomatic, like he's still working actively, having manual labor, and he's asymptomatic. His EF is preserved, is 50%. Uh, the left ventricular uh, end diastolic dimension is 73. And he's 36, otherwise no other medical problems, so he's a low surgical risk. So if you look at that, he falls into the AVR for class 2B indication. So what should we do next? Transcatator valve, bioprosthetic valve, mechanical valve, mechanical aortic root, aortic valve repair, or just medical therapy for blood pressure and follow-up. Sixty percent good with mechanical aortic valve. Okay. Uh, let's look at the intraoperative images. I was wondering whether anybody wants to comment on this in front of the panel. Yeah, it's bicuspid, uh, obviously, and it does. Uh, and as on the TTE, there's this reverse doming of the uh, cusps, and then it's obviously an eccentric jet that appears to come from the anterior uh, cusp. So it, it's probably due to prolapse of that cusp, and then that directs the jet right down onto the anterior mitral leaflet. And there's not all that much calcification. It looks like maybe the rafe is a little calcified. There is a little thickening of the co-joint cusp. Uh, so the good is intraoperative TE confirmed the preoperative uh, trans uh, thoracic echo. So the question is what to do. What are the surgical options for a bicuspid aortic valve? And you heard an excellent presentation from Dr. Sheff. So we could be valve replacement, it could be tissue valve or mechanical valve, and we heard previously the pros and cons, and there is a good data now that in young patients, if you put a, t a tissue valve, uh, there is a decrease uh, uh, long-term life expectancy. The Ross procedure had its cycles up and down. Uh, the problem is uh, some people quote some uh, is fervent argument pro or core for the Ross procedure that you convert from a one valve disease to a two valve disease, and also the significant importance of the degeneration of the knee aortic root when you put in the aortic position. But with the new technology, uh, <coughs> there is a revival for the Ross procedure, and the question is. Uh, the third option, which uh, not many people opted for aortic valve repair with or without ascending or aortic root replacement. So this is the classic aortic valve repair. Uh, at the beginning, when you have a bicuspid aortic valve, you have a lot of cost tissue to work with. Uh, uh, earlier in the late 90s and 2000s, the valve repair usually just either application or resecting of the co-joint cusp and using the resuspension called the cabral stitch in the commissure. This was worked very good in the short term, but there was many people, many patients came back with failure, so it fell out of the favor. Okay. So what's changed in the last 10 years, that what you have to understand, that's the functional aortic valve annulus, and I'm not going to go into too much detail. 
but it's a three-dimensional structure, and most of the echo, we usually get the annular diameter, the side tubular junction, and the aortic root diameters. But they're more important. If you want to do a successful repair, you have to really understand what, what does it mean, the cusp of the free margin of the aortic valve, the virtual bezel ring, and then also there's a two other important before you embark on repair is the geometric height or the effective height. The effective height basically is from the uh, <coughs> virtual bezel ring, you uh, measure it to the tip of the cusp, the free margin. But more important is the geometric height, which you can really measure in the echocardiogram. Usually it's in the operating room when you can measure in that from the annulus all the way to the top of the leaflet. And it gives, gives you an idea, do you have enough leaflet tissue to work with? These are very important parameters and you have to understand the echocardiogram. You can't just rely on the reading, you have to actually review the echo. So the anatomical dis uh, description, what came up that the Sievers classification, it doesn't really help us. It doesn't matter for a surgeon whether it's a left, right, left, none, uh, or the right, and none. It's more important, how can I repair the bicuspid aortic valve? So the new classification which came out from Belgium is a type A, type B, or type C. The type A, it's a very symmetrical. It's almost like a true bicuspid, which is very easy to repair. Type B, it's more asymmetrical, and the, the when you try to repair, you try to convert into a true bicuspid 180 configuration. And there is a type C, which is very asymmetrical. It almost looks like a tricuspid valve. And it's, when you run to repair, you have to repair almost like a tricuspid aortic valve. So in this case, we decided we're going to use an isolated bicuspid aortic valve repair. The patient had a normal aortic root diameter, 41, and there was no ascending aortic aneurysm. The patient, we know that all bicuspid aortic valve, they have an enlarged annulus. The sinotubular junction dilatation is not important in the bicuspid aortic valve like in a tricuspid aortic valve. Sometimes even just a sinotubular junction dilatation can cause tricuspid central regurgitation. In bicuspid valve is not important. We decided to do a suture annuloplasty. We used a Gore-Tex suture and we have to dissect in the aortic root all the way to the basal ring. When you're going to put a pursing suture and this patient, the aortic uh, annulus measured in the echocardiogram was over 34 millimeter, which is obviously it's abnormal for a 36 year old. So we corrected to his BSA, we put a dilator in and we cinch it down the aortic annulus to a over a 26 millimeter dilator. Following this, we did the leaflet work. It, it, there is always excess tissue, especially on the co-joint cusp. So you can do either a plication when you just put the plicating stitches without resecting, or sometimes you can take out a small triangular resection similar like in a mitral repair in a P2 resection, and you're going to repair it. So this is the post cross clamp TE was still on cardiopulmonary bypass, meaning the heart is completely empty and we are looking at this transgastric view. I wanted to point out one important thing. So when we remove the cross clamp, the heart is not beating and we look immediately, do we have LV distension? While you're on a heart lung machine, it's an aortic regurgitation producing condition, yes? So if you have AI, you're going to see it immediately. So you can see that while you're on full bypass and the heart is empty, there is no regurgitation. So basically at this point, we are clapping ourselves on the shoulder that we did an excellent job. It looks perfect. <laughs> so we came off bypass and we're ready for the pronomine and the uh, echocardiographer come in again to a final view. And excellent. this is the image what we see. Remember, when we removed the cross clamp, there was no aortic regurgitation. So the question is, what would you tell the surgeon? Pretty good, looks fantastic, as good as it gets, re repair or valve replacement. He doesn't know who, what you're voting for, so. So my question was, should I go back in a 36 year old, should I accept more than near perfect result? What really bothered me the most importantly that if you remember the images when we just removed the cross clamp time, there was no aortic, there is none. There was nothing or not even one RBC went through. So it was nearly perfect. And I could not understand how come when the heart is beating and ejecting, suddenly we have uh, regurgitation. And there was one important, I could not put in the slide, when they remeasured the aortic annulus, it still measured 34 millimeter. And I could not understand because I cinched it up, tied it up over. So we, I decided to go back on cardiopulmonary bypass, and then when the heart is decompressed, I looked at the annular, and I realized that the stitch, it's a Gore-Tex stitch, and if you remember, Gore-Tex material is very slippery. So the stitch, uh, obviously poor surgical technique, it came apart, it just slipped through. So the annular stabilization was very, very important. So we went back, we did, redid it again over annular st stabilization stitch, we tied more knots instead of 10, we put like 15 or 16 knots. 
And then on the repeat images, you can see that we came off again. You can see there is still no regurgitation. And uh, you can see the gradient, the mean gradient of 10 millimeter mercury. Now, there will be always, when you repair a bicuspid aortic valve, there will be some gradient. Usually it's in uh, around 10. It's between the, you know, 8 to 12. But usually it shouldn't be more than 12 millimeter mercury. And these are no long-term consequences. So the take-home points. Bicuspid aortic valve can cause eccentric aortic regurgitation. Severe AR causes left ventricular enlargement. We discussed the indication for a, a, a aortic valve surgery in, in aortic regurgitation. Aortic valve repair is an option for select patient. And bicuspid aortic valve repair has low operative mortality. And actually, there are reports that there is excellent long-term durability if you follow the basic principles. At 10 years, probably there are reports from uh, Europe that there is 80 to 90% freedom from reoperation in a bicuspid aortic valve. Thank you.